Nations uh, webinar on the upcoming Supreme Court term. I'm Glenn Lamy. I'm Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. WLF's in its 43rd year of advocating for laws and legal policies that foster free enterprise, and this is our 33rd year of presenting a preview of the upcoming Supreme Court term and, and our first uh, in doing so in a virtual way. What was already going to be an interesting term because it became all the more so this past week with uh, first with the term the court's announcement that it would once again be doing oral arguments telephonically, and then with the passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, this term, WLF has filed amicus briefs in a number of cases to be discussed today, including Facebook versus Dukewood, Nestle versus Doe, and Ford Motor Company versus Montana 8th Judicial District Court. And on October 2nd, we'll be filing our brief in the AMG versus Capital versus FTC case. In addition to the merits cases, we've asked our speakers to make note of any important petitions for certiorari. On that front, WLF will be supporting Goldman Sachs in a case that addresses the fraud on the market theory for securities fraud cases, as well as IQVIA versus Musat, the case involving the application of the court's BMS specific jurisdiction decision in the class action context. A couple of things to note for viewers, this program is being recorded if you're uh, active on Twitter during the event, they have a hashtag is, is uh, hashtag WLF preview. If you have any questions for our presenters, please click on the Q&A tab in the chat box. And then if you uh, would like to uh, access the slides that Adam and John are using, you can get those uh, as PDF files there as well. Uh, introduce the speakers in the order in which they present. Uh, leading off today will be Adam, Dr. Adam Feldman. Adam is the creator of and main author for EmpiricalScotus.com, a blog that looks at contemporary and Supreme Court issues in an empirical view. He has a PhD in political science from USC and a JD from Cal Berkeley School of Law. He's also the principal for the legal data consulting firm Optimized Legal. Previously, Adam practiced law at two law firms. Second will be Kate Stetson, who's the co-director of Hogan Lovell's appellate practice group and an elected member of the firm's global board. She's argued in the US Supreme Court and all but one of, of the federal circuits. Practice cuts across many industries and subject matters. And she's a fellow of the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers. Finishing up today will be John Cohen, who's a member of Sidley's, uh, Sidley Austin's complex commercial litigation practice and Supreme Court and appellate practice. He's argued cases in the US Supreme Court, federal courts of appeals and the federal district courts. Um, he was a deputy assistant attorney general in the Justice Department and served as a clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas. Adam, if you could get us started. Everybody can, uh, can hear me now. Uh, Thanks for coming to listen today. Uh, my name is Adam Feldman, as Glenn mentioned, and uh, I uh, run the Empirical SCOTUS blog. I also teach and work as a consultant uh, with attorneys. I teach college level political science and uh, constitutional law. Um, so I think of my approach to law a little bit uh, like legal analytics uh, in an application of law. So it's uh, similar to how analytics has been applied to sports over the last several years. I contend that we can better understand legal decision-making through the use of statistics. And it's interesting to think of, uh, think of this in light of Chief Justice Roberts' comments during his confirmation about the role of the judge, similar to the role of the umpire. So today I'm going to briefly talk about uh, the trajectory coming from last Supreme Court term to this Supreme Court term. Uh, I, I take a, a statistical look at this. Um, and, uh, and so probably we'll be presenting something a little bit different than talking about uh, just the specific cases like the other presenters. Um, so uh, the first slide that uh, you're looking at looks at uh, five, four cases from the Supreme Court over the last uh, 10 years. And what it shows is the, in red, it's the percentage of these five, four cases that were decided by conservative justices uh, in the majority. In blue, it shows the number of uh, cases decided by liberal justice, uh, justices in the majority. And in yellow, it shows uh, five, four cases decided by a mix of justices. This is interesting for several reasons. Um, in, in light of uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's recent passing, uh, this is interesting because we might see 
uh, a shift to the right from here. But it's also interesting since the court has had mainly a conservative bent since John Roberts uh, became chief justice in 2005. And yet we don't see a, a strong conservative uh, flux in uh, five, four decisions over, uh, over this period in OT uh, 2015, we even see a majority of these decisions uh, were made in the liberal direction. Um, so one thing to think about is that the court is highly polarized at this point. Um, we can see that through the percent of 5-4 decisions coming either in the liberal or conservative direction, but not with justices across the mix of ideologies. But also uh, the fact that there's uh, not necessarily a shift in the conservative direction as much as we would think. And so it'll be uh, extremely interesting to see who fills Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat. And depending on that, if this puts the court even farther to the right, um, and which very well might affect the court's business jurisprudence, as I will get to in a moment. Now, this next slide takes a look at the justices' frequencies in the majority from this last term. This is something that I worked on for SCOTUS blog, a uh, blog dedicated to uh, studying the United States Supreme Court. And this shows the frequency of the majority from the last term and over the last uh, several terms. Uh, it shows the by individual justice, and if we take a look at the frequency of the majority, especially focused on uh, Roberts from last term, he was in the majority over 95% in divided cases and 97% in unanimous cases. This means Chief Justice Roberts was essentially in the majority in just about every case that the court decided. So it shows that he's now really the center of the court. Justice Kavanaugh is only a few percentage points behind him and Justice Gorsuch isn't that far behind. Um, these frequencies increase over time. So they become, if you look at their trajectories over time, they, these justices become more and more in the majority. And it hints at a strong right wing of the court, um, but not a hard right. So if we look at justices Thomas and Alito, who far fall farther to the right than uh, these other justices that I just mentioned, they're in the majority much uh, less frequently than justices Roberts, uh, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch. So this points at a more moderate right position of where the court's currently leaning. We can also see that the liberal justices aren't in the majority significantly less often than uh, Justices Thomas and Alito, but we see that Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor are a little bit less frequently in the majority than Justices Kagan and Breyer, also hinting at this soft middle where we have the more moderate left more frequently in the majority than we do those farther to the left. So once again, what happens to Ginsburg's seat is extremely important where the center of the court is going to lie moving forward. And the center of the court generally pushes the decision-making, especially in hot button case cases that are highly contentious and polarized between the justices. So here's a slide that takes a look at uh, the amici uh, for next term in, uh, in, in uh, the search stage. Uh, so looking at the filers that were most frequently uh, most frequently filed briefs before the petitions were granted. And this is interesting from a free enterprise perspective because of some of the groups that are involved, but also from a, a set to get a sense of who's actually good at predicting which cases are going to get, uh, get voted in on cert. Um, now, the first two uh, bars are clusters of groups. So we have clusters of academics and individuals who don't fall under a more common group rubric. The same can be said for states. Uh, these are sort of briefs for many states, but the Chamber of Commerce had five briefs in cases that were later granted on petition. Cato Institute had three, WLF had two. So it's one of the few groups out there right now that had two briefs at the cert stage that were granted on cert. The same can be said for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And also public interest groups have been successful at this, the Cato Institute, uh, Jewish Coalition for Religious Liberty, Foundation for Moral Law, and Americans for Prosperity Foundation. So these are the groups that have been most successful this term so far, getting the amicus briefs filed in petitions that were later granted on cert. We can also look at which attorneys uh, are counsel of record in the most cases this term. So we have a, a large diversity in, on one hand of attorneys that are gonna be participating in these cases. Um, but we also have a consistency. So in terms of diversity, there are only two 
uh, attorneys that are so far uh, listed as counsel of record on granted cases so far this term, Neil Katyal uh, from Hogan Lavelle, and also Kyle Hawkins, who's the uh, Solicitor General for the state of Texas. But when we look down this list, along with these two attorneys that have uh, two counsel of records for cases that were granted on cert, we also see a, a lot of attorneys that have uh, argued before in the Supreme Court. Tom Goldstein, um, we have Sarah Harrington, Paul Hughes, Paul Clements on there, Lisa Blatt. So names that come up frequently in the Supreme Court's uh, uh, in the Supreme Court's dockets and oral arguments. And we see that the, the strength of the Supreme Court bar, now this is the Supreme Court bar in quotation marks, not those attorneys that practice before the Supreme Court, before the Supreme Court, but attorneys that are highly skilled and have expertise in Supreme Court practice come up again and again. And this is actually something that Chief Justice Roberts talked about in an article that I cite uh, fairly frequently uh, that was published the year he was confirmed to the uh, Supreme Court in 2005. Where he talks about the strength and importance of uh, expert Supreme Court attorneys arguing cases before the Supreme Court. So it's interesting to see the attorneys. These are names that come up a lot and, uh, and definitely worth a look uh, later on at the names that are on this slide besides the ones that I mentioned. We can also look at cases by the number of amicus briefs that were filed in them. So this is another way to look at the importance of the cases. These are amicus briefs also filed at the petition stage. So we're not looking at the merit stage. And so these are briefs that are filed in the hopes that the, the case is going to get granted on cert, but with the possibility that there is not going to be a grant on the case and the brief is going to lead to nowhere. So it's an expectation, a hope that this will push the court, give a signal of the importance of the case to the justices, to the clerks, that this is a case that merits their full uh, full oral argument. Um, so we see the case with the most amicus briefs at the cert stage was the Google versus Oracle case. Um, that is going to be argued uh, in October of, uh, of this term. Uh, I actually uh, was fortunate to file a uh, brief on the merit stage uh, in support of Google's position in this case, uh, along with a colleague of mine. Um, and it's really uh, a quite interesting case to look at. Uh, looks at the language that's used in, uh, in, in Oracle uh, uh, and in their Java products and how Google is trying to uh, have a fair use argument for the use of this code in their Android applications. Um, so definitely an important uh, case and important for business interests as well. Um, but we also see several other cases with multiple amicus briefs. The Nestle case that Len mentioned before, um, the Facebook case. So many of these cases had at least one amicus brief filed in them at the search stage, which points to the importance of amicus briefs at the search stage, um, really acting as a, a signal for the justices so they can decide with some extra information on what cases they should take and which cases are have the substantial importance uh, to a cross-section of the population that the court's really looking for, especially now since the court's docket is so small, they're only hearing between 60 and 70 cases a term. It's not like the Supreme Court used to be where they would take 150 to 200 cases a term. Now we only have a fraction of those. So it, the, courts, the court really needs a signal for which cases are the most important that warrant their uh, full uh, scope of, of uh, decision-making. We can also look at cases that are still at the uh, petition stage that haven't been granted that have a high level of amicus support. So this looks at the cases uh, that are still not granted or denied on cert that have the most amicus briefs. So we can see one case uh, with uh, 13 amicus briefs uh, looks at uh, an election law feature in Arizona. Uh, there are several cases with, uh, with 10 amicus briefs uh, filed at the cert stage, uh, some with nine. So we can see that multiple amicus briefs are getting filed in some hot button uh, cases. And uh, this really lends itself to speaking to the issues that, the, uh, that, that folks in the public and especially in interest groups want to put in front of the justices. We have several cases on here that look at First Amendment issues. Um, that's a topic that has come up again and again over recent years. Um, we also have uh, an abortion case up here 
So um, it's another issue that is getting pushed in front of the justices again and again, and an issue that's going to uh, not lose uh, its importance now that, that Justice Ginsburg passed away. Uh, the, it's, uh, the discussion is going to continue about what's going to happen, to the, what's the future for Roe versus Wade, uh, will this still be good law in a few years? Uh, and will the justices take up another case on abortion? As we saw last term, the abortion uh, decision from Louisiana, uh, Chief Justice Roberts was the swing vote in this case. And uh, that led to a, a 5-4 decision overturning the Louisiana law that looked to, uh, looked to limit the, uh, the doctors admitting privileges at hospitals in Louisiana, which was very similar to the Texas decision in Holman's Health versus Heller's that just a few terms before. Now with Justice Ginsburg no longer on the court, there's no fifth vote necessarily in favor of that uh, direction. So it really is dependent upon who the next justice is nominated to the Supreme Court. If we look at the cases that are granted on cert so far this term, we can see that they come from all across the United States. These are from, this shows the number of grants from the various geographic circuits uh, as well as uh, state courts and original jurisdiction. There's two cases even granted on cert from the Court of Appeals for the uh, Armed Forces. Uh, the circuit that has the most grants so far with seven is the Fifth Circuit, which actually is ahead of the Ninth Circuit, which tends to have the most and still might have the most grants by the end of the, uh, the, the grants for the Supreme Court term. Um, but as, as we see, there's really a mix right now uh, but there's a cluster from the Fifth Circuit, which is uh, especially interesting. So um, we'll see what happens as the rest of the merits docket shapes out over the next uh, month or two. This slide takes a look at cases where there's open calls for uh, views of the Solicitor General, another signal to the Supreme Court for when a case is especially important. Um, and so this process is when the Supreme Court justices actually asked the SG, the top attorney for the United States, to give views on whether a case should be granted on cert at the, when it's still at the petition stage. And this shows that there's already a high level importance placed on the case by the justices. And so even if the, the SG comes back and says that the, the SG's office isn't interested in, in arguing the case, that this is not important, this shows that there's already great importance placed on this case. So these cases in particular are um, under, under heavy uh, analysis by the court. The Americans for Prosperity case also has a high level of amicus briefs on it. So that's one in particular that probably has a very high likelihood of grant. Um, there's the, currently a pipeline case, another important business case that is, is on a call for a, a CVSG. Um, so there are some interesting cases to look at that are, are open for questions from the Solicitor General and that we also might see uh, granted later this term. Now, this slide goes to look at the number of cases the Supreme Court's hearing each term. As I mentioned previously, the Supreme Court's hearing far fewer cases than it had in the past, uh, at points when it had well over 200 cases. It now actually had the fewest cases last term and due to COVID-19 and having some arguments pushed off till this term. The court took fewer cases on oral argument than it had since the Civil War and before that, since the 1840s. So there's really been a, a sharp decline in the cases that the court's taking each term. And this emphasizes even more the importance that the court takes important cases, cases that apply to a large cross-section of the population because it's dealing with so few issues each term and a, in a decreasing number, you know, we might see 60 cases uh, granted this term. It wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility. We can look at the number of uh, amicus briefs filed at the search stage for uh, law firms as well as attorneys. Attorneys, I showed before here, this shows law firms with the most amicus briefs uh, filed, uh, excuse me, law firms that are uh, arguing the most cases that are already granted. And there's two uh, firms with already three arguments this term, or Carrington and Hope and Lavelle, uh, the Texas AG's office and uh, Goldstein Russell have two. So we see the same idea of multiple players coming up again and again, both in terms of law firms and attorneys arguing. Uh, we can actually move ahead from this slide just to look at the pace of grants uh, so far this term. The pace of grants right now for OT20 is in a uh, thin blue line that's below the thick blue line of OT19. 
So we can see that there have actually been fewer cases granted on cert so far this term than there were last term. And this is sort of surprising because the only two terms in recent memory where there were fewer grants at this point were the terms when after Scalia passed and before Gorsuch was nominated uh, to his Supreme Court justiceship, when there were eight justices and they were frankly, uh, I think, um, somewhat uh, uh, afraid of rulings that had an evenly divided court and instead wanted to have a ninth justice on that could uh, be the decision maker that could uh, that could actually push them in one direction or the other in cases where they were split five to four. So we see that there's still not as many cases granted this term as there were last term at this point in time. This hints at the possibility that we're gonna have a, uh, a small merits docket again this term. Uh, this looks at, this just goes to showcase Robert's frequency in the majority. And I said he was 97% in the majority last term. The only justice in the Roberts court that's been 97% in the majority was Justice Kennedy. Aside from Chief Justice Roberts, the only Chief Justice in over the last uh, 50 years that was in the majority as frequently as Chief Justice Roberts was Justice Vincent in 1949. And aside from Justice Kennedy, the last justice that was in the justice in the majority 97% of the time was Justice Brennan in 1968. So this just shows Chief Justice Roberts' strength in the majority to this point. Um, and what he might be in terms of the center of the court moving forward. Okay, so that's uh, all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Kate, if you could take the uh, floor up. Kate, you go ahead. Kate, you're up. Sorry for the delay here. Actually, it seems that Kate's having some problems here. So John, if you are available to to go ahead, um, please do so. Hey, Glenn, can you see and hear me? Yes, and I put up your slides for you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, and, and greetings from Arkansas. Um, sorry you have to look at me and hear me instead of Kate, but hopefully she'll be back online very soon. Um, I'm pleased to be here. It's an honor to be on this panel, and I'm especially pleased to be able to discuss three cases that relate to consumer protection, an area of the law in which I frequently litigate. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the FTC cases and Facebook, and then just give a little primer on the Ford case. That's going to be uh, Kate's bailiwick. She's going to talk about it in depth very thoroughly. I just want to say a couple quick words on that. Um, and then if there's time, uh, we'll have a little bonus case, the Oracle Google matter. But first, the consumer protection cases. The way I see it, these cases and consumer protection matters in general are often represented by good intentions. After all, we don't like shysters by and large. I know I don't. We don't like to see consumers get ripped off or harassed. And if there's an injury, generally, we want there to be a remedy. So consumer protection laws, statutes, cases are often animated by good intentions. The problem is that there are also unintended consequences. Our system of justice is imperfect, and these imperfections are laid bare in the matters that we have before us in the Supreme Court, potentially with troubling consequences for free enterprise and, for, and in general. There are three particular problems 
for a free enterprise that I see coming from these cases. One is the result of overly aggressive government agencies, such as the Federal Trade Commission. The second is the result of statutory penalties in ambiguous statutes, like the Telephone Consumer Protection Act 1991, which is at issue in the Facebook case. And third is litigation tourism. And this is the Ford matter, which again, Kate's gonna talk about later on. Um, litigation tourism is when you have plaintiffs who travel around the country with their meritless claims, trying to find the ideal jurisdiction, even if there is no nexus between the defendant's forum contacts and the particular claims at issue. So we see this issue as well in the cases before the Supreme Court. But starting with the overly aggressive government agencies, I like the Federal Trade Commission and I agree with about 80 some odd percent of what they do because they're protecting consumers. But sometimes they get aggressive, too aggressive in how they construe their own jurisdiction and authority. And we see that in the two FTC matters before the court. AMG Capital Management coming out of the Ninth Circuit and Credit Bureau Center coming out of the Seventh Circuit. Both of these cases interpret Section 13B of the FTC Act, which by its terms permits the commission to file suit, quote, to enjoin unlawful acts. More specifically, the statute speaks of remedies. It provides for temporary restraining orders, preliminary injunctions, and permanent injunctions. Significantly, the provision makes no mention whatsoever of restitution or other monetary relief. The provision does not even speak broadly of equitable relief, which the Supreme Court in lieu last term said could include disgorgement, which is money in certain circumstances. But 13B does not even use that term. Nonetheless, every court that has addressed the issue, except for the Seventh Circuit, has construed injunctions to include money like restitution. The Seventh Circuit had gone the same way, but broke from that precedent recently, and in my view, reached the right conclusion. Why do we care? After all, in these particular cases, I think there's little dispute that the defendants are bad actors. AMG misrepresented the terms for payday loans, including triple digit interest rates and renewals. They're ripping off consumers. Credit Bureau Center, for its part, deceptively offered free credit reports, free in quotes, because they obscured a key detail. There was a roughly $30 per month membership subscription. So neither of these cases involves innocent actors, from what I can tell. People might disagree. But the reason why we care. And the reason why there's a potential impact on free enterprise is that what the FTC often does, understandably, is they develop law favorable to them by relying on bad actors, getting case law that helps them, and then using that case law to go after legitimate actors that are not ripping off consumers. And as a result of the bad case law created from bad facts, there's tremendous hydraulic pressure for companies to settle these cases. When the FTC goes to the bargaining table, and asks for hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars in restitution, that makes companies blink oftentimes. Fortunately, not all the time. Um, I represented Bayer in the Phillips Cole and Health litigation in which the FTC, in addition to seeking hundreds of millions of dollars, tried to create a new test on the fly. And we said no, and we won. The judge ruled our way, there was no liability. My colleagues did the same thing in the direct TV litigation, so sometimes Companies will say no to the FTC and it pays off. But we also see that the FTC is able to extract significant amounts of money in other cases, not all of which involve bad actors. In 2019, the FTC got over a billion dollars. Some cases might involve bad actors, other cases do not. But the trouble is there's hydraulic pressure, significant, tremendous pressure to sell. And that's one reason why we care about the misinterpretation of statutes like 13b. Why else do we care? The rule of law. Injunction does not mean restitution. And if you look at the structure of the statute, you see that other provisions of Congress's enactment speak about money, but 13b does not. There's also due process and notice. Those other provisions require the FTC to give notice of a violation to a defendant by obtaining a cease and desist order or by promulgating a final rule that defines with specificity the prohibited act. 
Finally, separation of powers. Recent Supreme Court jurisprudence counsels against the judicial creation of remedies that are inconsistent with the text. The FTC relies on cases from the 1940s and 1960s that took a different approach to statutory construction and the rule of law, but those antiquated cases are inconsistent with current jurisprudence. That's why we care. A couple other final observations. One, FTC is in the rowboat all alone on this one. DOJ is not on the briefs. The Solicitor General's office is not doing oral argument. Second, in a very fundamental way, the FTC might already have lost under the Lew decision I mentioned from last term, which construed equitable, mon equitable relief to include money in certain circumstances. But the court made clear that the relief is limited. It covers net profits, not revenues. The money has to result from the unlawful activity, the infringing component, not the entire business or product. And the money, generally speaking, has to go to victims and not the U.S. Treasury. So the FTC already has been handicapped in the way it can go after companies by demanding significant amount of monies, regardless of what happens in these two pending matters. So that's all I got to say about the FTC cases. Again, I think that although the particular defendants are bad actors, there are potential consequences for free enterprise. Fortunately, I think the Supreme Court's going to go the right way on this one. Turning to the next case, the Facebook matter, this raises the issue of statutory penalties in statutes that are ambiguous at best. The, the statute at issue is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991. And the TCPA has been a very profitable, lucrative cottage industry for the plaintiff's bar, mostly because you have statutory penalties of 500 bucks, which can be trebled if there's um, a knowing or willful act trebled to $1,500. So if you look at this bar chart, um, you'll see that in 2007 and 2008, there are very few TCPA cases. You could barely see the bars. They're so small. That number shot up in 2012 to over 1,000. And then by 2016, you exceeded 4,500. So the plaintiff's bar is making a lot of money, much the way the FTC does under its cases, by going to companies and saying, if you lose, you could be facing hundreds of millions of dollars in exposure. Companies settle because of the hydraulic pressure. Um, the provision at issue here um, concerns the auto dialing um, provisions in the statute. And what it says in relevant part is that the statute prohibits the use of, quote, any automated and any automatic telephone dialing system or an artificial or pre-recorded voice to make a call to any cellular telephone service or other specified targets unless there's prior express consent from the consumer. So the relevant provision here is automatic telephone dialing system. We're going to turn to that in a second. The statute also prohibits calls to residential landlines using an artificial or pre-recorded voice without the express prior consent. Again, as noted, you have statutory penalties, 500 bucks, which can be tripled. And um, one other final piece of background, very significantly, the FCC and several circuit courts have said that the word call includes texts, which boggles my mind because calls and texts are not the same thing. Um, to find the best exposition of this point, I would say look at the Washington Legal Foundation brief which was extremely elegant and well-written. Um, I found it overwhelmingly persuasive. I mean, calls and texts simply are not the same thing. So I think they got it right. Unfortunately, that particular issue is not being teed up in this case, was not preserved or presented. So maybe in another matter, the Supreme Court can pair back on that one. But for the moment, we have to assume that calls include texts. So what did Facebook do in this case, right? Because again, and the point of the statute is to stop those annoying, harassing calls or texts that you don't want. Um, but what Facebook did here is a little bit different. They actually had consumer protection matters that were designed to protect their consumers, to protect Facebook subscribers. So under the security protocol, what Facebook does is, is it sends text messages to consumers if an account has been accessed by an unrecognized device or browser. And this is an opt-in security feature. So when you get your Facebook account, you have the option to opt-in and give your cell phone number. And if you do, then you get texts 
if there's this suspicious access to the unrecognized device or browser. Um, Facebook stores the number and then texts you when there's that access. In this case, the plaintiff did not opt in. There was a mistake of some sort. He received text messages even though he never had a Facebook account. So something went wrong here, admittedly. Unclear exactly what. Probably what happened was the plaintiff's phone number was recycled from a prior person who had a Facebook account and opted in, and Facebook didn't know the numbers recycled. So when it detected that access, it sent a text to that number, which is now the plaintiff's number. But regardless, everyone agrees it was an errant message. But the important thing is that that errant message was not the product of a, quote, random or sequential number generator. Facebook sent it because it thought there was unauthorized access. It wasn't some sort of a random auto call. And this is relevant, of course, because you got the plain terms of the text. Um, as mentioned, the relevant language is automatic telephone dialing system, which is defined in the statute. It means equipment which has the capacity, A, to store or produce telephone numbers to be called, comma, using a random or sequential number generator, and B, to dial such numbers. I think it's pretty clear that the gerund, the using phrase, modifies both store and produce, just reading the plain language, but the Ninth Circuit and then subsequently Second Circuit held that that highlighted phrase modifies only produce, not store. So therefore, if you do what Facebook does and you store numbers, not randomly, but you store those numbers and you then send a text or make a call um, when something happens, you have somehow violated the TCPA and you're opening yourself up to the potentially $1,500 in statutory penalties per incident. That's kind of crazy. It's not consistent with the text and it also opens up absurd consequences such as we all now face potential liability because of our smartphones. Our phones store numbers and under the Ninth Circuit's logic or lack thereof, if you send an errant text or make an erroneous phone call from a stored number, then somehow you could be opening yourself up to liability, which strikes me at least as kind of crazy. Um, that's it for the Facebook case. The Ford case, again, I'm not going to say much about it. This is Kate's bailiwick. I just want to add that my firm um, and I, we filed a brief on behalf of Pharma in this matter. Um, in our view, but for our connection between the state's informed contacts and the plaintiff's claims is not enough. It's not enough to have a but-for connection. There should be something more material. There must be a material link between the defendant's form conduct and the plaintiff's specific claims. And just by way of context, this happens a lot um, in pharmaceutical cases where plaintiffs are shopping for a favorable forum. And what we've seen in a bunch of cases is plaintiffs will say that the drug was tested in clinical trials all around the country. Clinical trials typically involve dozens of states, potentially all 50 states, because you want to have a broad cross-section of participants in the study. You want a different demographic group, so you have lots of states participating. In that sense, each of those states is a but-for cause of the drug being approved, and therefore, in a very, a very attenuated sense, a but-for cause of any injury that someone gets anywhere as a result of taking the drug, that's too attenuated, that's kind of crazy. But for causation should not be enough, it should be a material link. Um, one case that talks about this very nicely is the Rios litigation. The Illinois Supreme Court got this right, rejecting jurisdiction on the pleadings because the clinical trials and other in-state contacts did not supply adequate or jurisdictionally relevant links. So that's all I'm going to say about this case. Kate's going to discuss it in much more detail and more eloquently in just a bit. Um, finally, one last case that Glenn asked me to address. Um, it's not consumer protection per se, but Glenn asked me to address it, and I do everything that Glenn wants me to do. So just very briefly, um, the Google versus Oracle litigation, which involves you know, two behemoths, um, tons of heavy hitters. Virtually every law firm in the country has dropped in an amicus brief in this case. Um, this case could end up being a seminal decision on the application of copyright laws to the to computer software 
or potentially could end up in a complete fizzle with the Supreme Court punting and deferring on jury findings. At this point, I don't know which one, but um, just briefly by way of background, after Steve Jobs announced the first iPhone, Google faced a potential existential crisis because its Android system, still under development, was poised to take on the BlackBerry and not much else. It was of a different generation than the iPhone. So Google had to play catch up to get to Apple and it didn't have the time to start from scratch. So what it did was it tried to use portions of Oracle's then son's Java platform. Um, they negotiated the license, but negotiations broke down. So Google went ahead with essentially a self-help mechanism. They copied 11,000 plus lines of computer code as well as the organization and relationship among the lines of code. So Oracle understandably sued under the Copyright Act. A jury found Google infringed, but hung on the defense of fair use. The case went up to the federal circuit. There's a subsequent remand, a second jury, which found for Google on fair use, another appeal. The federal circuit reversed that decision and found no fair use as a matter of law. So, the case is now before the Supreme Court. Court granted cert on two questions. The first is whether or not uh, the copyright protections extend to the Java code at issue. The second is fair use. Literally over, over 60 amicus briefs have been filed in this case, um, roughly 50-50 evenly split between the two sides. SG filed a brief on behalf of Oracle. And after all that, despite all these briefs, the Supreme Court apparently felt it didn't have enough briefing and so it asked for more, directing the parties to file supplemental letter briefs on the standard of review for the second question, the one on fair use, including the implications, if any, of the Seventh Amendment. Um, argument is scheduled uh, for a couple of weeks, October 7th. The case was supposed to be heard last, um, last term, but because of COVID, the case was the fall. I don't know what's gonna happen. Look, I mean, there are lots of prognostications out there. Um, up in the air. I don't know. I'm not going to weigh in on this one because I'm just really bad at guessing the outcome cases. Um, you know, and especially since my firm and I do some work for Oracle, I, I probably am a little bit biased in this one. But um, look, as for what might happen, as I said, there's there's a risk the court could punt. At least one justice is interested in the standard review. I don't know what the briefing did on that justice's views. I hope the court doesn't punt. It might. Um, you know, at the same time, there are very significant issues here that could benefit from Supreme Court resolution. Just uh, one final thought, and then um, I'll wrap this up. My final thought is, on a fundamental level, Google already has one because the, with, with the Java code that it got, the company survived that existential crisis. Um, as you probably know, the Android platform outsells Apple and Microsoft combined. So regardless of whether Google loses, regardless of whether it has to pay damages, it has already profited immensely from the use of Oracle's code. So that's it. I see that Kate is back online. I'm going to hand over the mic. Thanks very much, Hi. John. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Glenn, can you hear me? Yes. OK, fantastic. Sorry about my technical difficulties earlier. Um, very happy to be with all of you. I will try to make it up to you now. Um, I will not, however, be making it up to you with slides because, as I told Glenn, I am highly allergic to slides. Uh, so I'm just going to talk with you for a little while. I'm going to talk about uh, three cases, one of them being the Ford case, um, the which uh, Adam called the litigation tourism case, uh, one of them being the uh, alien tort statute Nestle case, and the last being the Henry Schein uh, arbitration case. So we're going to cover in a short period of time uh, the Ford Crown Victoria uh, cocoa production and dental equipment, just so you can keep tabs on things. So to start on general jurisdiction and specific jurisdiction, just as a quick um, refresher course from your first week of law school, the Supreme Court in Daimler several years ago essentially tightened the strings on general jurisdiction uh, beyond what the a lot of the lower courts were doing at the time. And what the Daimler court held was that outside of the state of incorporation or the principal place of business, 
general jurisdiction, which means all purpose jurisdiction, is available only when a corporation's affiliations are so continuous and systematic as to render the company essentially at home in the forum state. But as you might imagine, after the strictures of general jurisdiction got tightened, it's almost like pressing on a water balloon, uh, with the shrinking of general jurisdiction came some judicial attempts to expand specific personal jurisdiction, also known as case-linked jurisdiction. Uh, so the Supreme Court has taken a couple cracks at this before, most recently in Walden versus Fiori um, and Bristol Myers Squibb in 2017. But the issue is back, uh, and the issue is back in the form of two cases consolidated now involving used Fords. So just to articulate the specific jurisdiction standard, a, a forum state's exercise of specific jurisdiction, case-linked jurisdiction, is uh, in line with due process if the defendant has certain minimum contacts with it. You probably remember this from International Shoe and Burger King and so forth. Um, but those minimum contacts under a specific jurisdiction regime have to be suit related. The defendant has to purposely avail itself of the forum and the plaintiff's suit must arise out of or relate to those activities. And it's that last phrase, arise out of or relate to those activities, it's become really the finding issue here. So the two cases involved in the Ford uh, Consolidated Appeal came from Montana and Minnesota. The Montana issue arose when a Montana resident was uh, driving a Ford, a 1996 Ford Explorer, a uh, tread tire, a uh, tire tread separated. Uh, she got into an accident and was killed. Uh, her personal representative sued Ford in Montana State Court. And Ford moved to dismiss the suit for lack of jurisdiction. And what Ford said was this 1996 Explorer was assembled in Kentucky. It was sold in the first instance by Ford into Washington State uh, and bought by an Oregon residence. And then it changed hands through private sales multiple times before it ended up in Montana where the accident occurred. So that was Ford's position in the Montana case. Similarly, in Minnesota, there was a plaintiff last name Bandemer who was riding in the passenger seat of a 1994 Crown Victoria. Uh, the vehicle rear-ended another vehicle, uh, the airbag didn't deploy and Bandemer suffered some injuries. So he sued in state court in Minnesota. Ford moved to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. And it said, we designed the Crown Vic in Michigan. We built this in Ontario. We sold it into Bismarck in 2003, or I'm sorry, in 93. Uh, and it had changed hands outside of any you know, Ford dealership context many times since then. So both matters. You have a situation where, where Ford produced the vehicle and where it initially sold the vehicle were in states other than where those lawsuits were filed. Uh, but the lower courts in bo both Montana and Minnesota uh, ruled in favor of the plaintiffs. And both of them essentially said that Ford conducted enough activities in the state. Uh, it sold a lot of cars. It advertised in the state that it should have known that, you know, if one of its cars ended up in an accident in the state, it would be sued in the state. Um, that was essentially the reasoning of, of both of the cases collapsed into one. So, you know, the fact that Ford, though, has nothing to do with the fact that that car ended up in Minnesota or that car ended up in Montana is the problem, I think, with a specific personal jurisdiction argument, because the company's activities in the state that Montana and Minnesota courts were talking about have to have a connection, remember, to the plaintiff's claim, not just some generalized connection to the state. There has to be, in other words, some kind of causal link is what Ford says. The defendant needs to take or aim an action into that state that caused the plaintiff's injury. There's a contrary view, of course, uh, represented by the respondent. And I think what the respondent would say is, look, this isn't litigation tourism at all. Uh, this isn't, you know, a bus accident in France, like the Goodyear case, or a lawsuit brought in the U.S. about a German company's actions in Argentina, which was Daimler. Uh, this is about a Montana resident who was killed in Montana, driving a car on a Monta Montana highway, who sued a Montana state court. And it's about a Minnesota resident who was seriously injured uh, in Minnesota and brought suit in Minnesota. So, you know, the the argument by the plaintiffs is... 
this is not any kind of a forum shopping. This is actually a federalism issue. This is enabling plaintiffs who live in certain states who are injured by cars in their states or allegedly injured by cars in those states to pursue remedies in those states. Um, you know, cars are fungible. Cars are movable. Ford knew it. And I think what the what the thrust of the lower court's decision was, was that when a, when a manufacturer like Ford, you know, cultivates a relationship into the state, it had dealerships, it sold, you know, X number of Crown Victorias, it provides automatic automotive services. The identity of the car, the singular identity of the car doesn't really matter. It's just that Ford sells cars and this was a Ford car and therefore a suit should be able to be brought in that state. Um, the implications of this in terms of the business perspective, of course, go well beyond the motor vehicle context, in my view. You know, if the Supreme Court were to find that the mere kind of availing oneself of a market within a state satisfies that specific jurisdiction minimum contacts standard, uh, you know, Katie bar the door, because that will subject out-of-state manufacturers to the jurisdiction of every state where they advertise or where they conduct business or sell other products other than the one that is alleged to have done the harm. Uh, you know, that's, that's going to encourage all over again the kind of forum shopping uh, and panel shopping that we have seen so often coming out of certain states that the Supreme Court has had to step in and correct over the years. So that's personal jurisdiction. Um, let's turn now, and I should I should mention before I, I leave this for those of you um, who remember um, Adam's first one of his first slides on the, the individuals arguing before the court. My colleague uh, and partner Sean Morata has his first Supreme Court argument in this case uh, in October by the telephone, unfortunately. But we're all very excited for him. He is not a Supreme Court regular, but he will be after this. The second case is uh, the Nestle case um, con consolidated with Cargill, and this involves the alien tort statute. So again, a quick lesson on where the alien tort statute came from. Uh, in 1784, um, so before the statute was passed, there was an incident that was called at the time the Marbois Affair, where a French uh, adventurer, he was described, um, assaulted the secretary of the French Legion in Philadelphia. Uh, and then a few years after that, there was a New York police officer who caused literally an international incident uh, when he went into the Dutch ambassador's house uh, to arrest one of the Dutch ambassador's servants. And at the time, the, the federal government was not in a position to redress those incidents, uh, and they accordingly feared that those incidents could rise to an issue of serious uh, conflict with a foreign government. And thus grew the Alien Tort Statute. It was enacted in 1789, and it lets non-U.S. citizens seek damages in American courts in certain instances. And about for 200 years or so, it was very rarely used. It was it was used to address kind of core law of nations issues like piracy in U.S. territorial waters and so forth. And then in the waning years of the 20th century, it started to get more popular. And it led ultimately to a couple of recurring issues in the Supreme Court, one of them extraterritoriality and one of them corporate liability. The extraterritoriality issue was resolved in part in 2013 in a case called Kiobel, um, where the court concluded that there is a presumption against extraterritoriality that arises in alien tort statute lawsuits. And that presumption means there's nothing in the statute that says this case or this statute is designed to be applied extraterritorially. And what that necessarily means is that you look at that presumption against extraterritoriality and you ask the question, what is the focus of this statute? Uh, if the conduct relevant to the focus of the statute occurred in a foreign country, then the case is impermissibly extraterritorial as far as that statute is concerned. Um, in Kiobel, however, all of the relevant conduct in that case occurred outside the US. So the court in 2013 didn't need to determine what the focus of the ATS was because there wasn't uh, a factual circumstance that would give rise to a different answer. 
Uh, corporate liability is the second recurring issue. And that was taken up again in part in 2018 in the Jesner case. Uh, Jesner versus Arab Bank held that foreign corporations are not amenable to alien tort statute suits, but it left open specifically the question whether domestic corporations are similarly not amenable to ATS suits. So this case presents both of the questions that Kiobel and Jesner left open. What is the ATS's focus? And does general corporate uh, supervisory activity fall within it? And then may corporate defendants, domestic corporate defendants be liable under the ATS? Uh, the facts of the ATS lawsuit involve uh, allegations uh, by plaintiffs that unidentified foreigners kidnapped them, forced them to work as children in cocoa farms, um, that Nestle USA, which is the remaining domestic corporation and the domestic entity of Cargill, both um, put money into uh, those, those operations which occurred in the Ivory Coast that they made high level decisions about where they would purchase their cocoa, uh, including from the Ivory Toast Coast, and they turned a blind eye to the use of slave labor uh, on the farms, despite being aware of the practice in the Ivory Coast. Um, there's a long and winding history in this case. It's been going on, I think, for 15 years uh, and up and down, in part because of these recent Supreme Court decisions. But the nutshell is most recently, the Ninth Circuit uh, ordered the plaintiffs to uh, that they could remove the foreign defendant corporations after Jesner, but that uh, the plaintiffs could proceed against the domestic uh, corporations, um, and that uh, the the statute was not impermissibly extraterritorial. Uh, on bank the hearing was denied, uh, and I mention this because it was denied over an eight judge dissent. And it's really only in the Ninth Circuit could you have a denial of rehearing on bank under an eight judge dissent. Uh, but there you have it. So the issues about extraterritoriality and uh, corporate liability have to do with the nature of the conduct, among other things, that that's being uh, reviewed here. Um, where a statute doesn't say anything about being applicable extraterritorially, it is not. And that leads to that presumption that I mentioned earlier. Um, the court has uh, slipped into what it calls a two-step framework when it analyzes extraterritoriality. And, and the question here, of course, is that focus question I mentioned earlier. What is the focus of the statute? And here, you know, Nestle and Cargill's argument is that the focus of the statute is on the injury resulting from a tort committed in violation of the law of nations. And because all of the human rights injuries that plaintiffs allege occurred in the Ivory Coast and in Mali at the hands of foreign actors, the focus of the statute is outside the US and the statute can't be permissibly applied to Nestle and Cargill. There's a contrary argument, which is if you if you broaden the scope of the statute and you ask, you know, who is responsible for some of these decisions, uh, what the plaintiffs would say is Nestle and Cargill, for their parts, uh, oversaw and made their corporate purchasing decisions and other decisions in the U.S., uh, and that that corporate oversight has a role to play in assigning liability under the ATS. On the corporate liability issue, um, the ATS is has been construed over the years as being essentially a really narrow aperture. It provides jurisdiction in the U.S. for what the Supreme Court has called a modest number of international law violations. And the question about corporate liability is really whether the norm of corporate liability is sufficiently specific and universal and obligatory under international law? Is there an international norm imposing liability on corporations for acts taken as corporations? Um, the, what the Nestle and Cargill plaintiffs would say, petitioners would say, is that there is no, uh, or a very, very weak, I think is what is what said, uh, international norm suggesting that corporate liability is even a thing. Um, that the long held international law norm is that in liability resides in the individual. What the plaintiffs would say is, the norm that we are talking about uh, is liability for child slavery. 
And that is a uh, universally applicable and universally uh, accepted norm uh, that there should be a punishment for, for child slavery. So there's a debate about the operative norm in this case that I think is going to be the focus of the debate over corporate liability. Um, the implications for this case in terms of, of uh, U.S. corporations, of course, are quite significant. Uh, if either of those arguments succeeds, either extraterritoriality or uh, corporate liability, that means that uh, there will be no domestic corporate ATS liability uh, for allegations of human rights abuses committed abroad. There are other ways that plaintiffs might be able to bring lawsuits, but not under the ATS. Uh, so that would be a significant step forward and certainly a, a markedly significant reduction in what has been really the ballooning number of ATS cases, as I mentioned earlier, that we've seen over the past few decades. The last case I want to talk about in detail is the Henry Schein versus Archer and White case. And if this sounds like deja vu all over again, it's because it is. Um, you know, courts over the last you know, several decades, again, I think, have regularly evidenced uh, a hostility to arbitration. And the Supreme Court over the years generally has had to step in from time to time and reaffirm the Federal Arbitration Act's strong commitment to arbitration where the parties so agree. Uh, this particular case uh, is unusual because it is back before the Supreme Court on another arbitration issue after having been decided in a previous term. That's why it sounds familiar. So in brief background, Archer and White uh, is a distributor of dental equipment. It sued Henry Schein, who's another distributor of dental equipment. I didn't know there were more than one. Uh, Schein moved to compel arbitration pursuant to an, a, a dealer agreement between the two parties. And what the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals initially concluded was that where the parties had clearly and unmistakably intended to delegate arbitrability to an arbitrator, the motion to compel arbitration should be granted and that issue sent to the arbitrator, except where the argument uh, that the claim is within this So it concluded that that particular claim was wholly reversed in a decision by Justice Kavanaugh. Uh, the court concluded that a court may not decide the question of arbitrability if the parties have clearly and unmistakably delegated that to an arbitrator, even if the court believes that that argument in favor of arbitrability was wholly groundless. So the case goes back to the Fifth Circuit uh, for it to consider whether the contract, in fact, delegated that arbitrability question to an arbitrator. On remand, the Fifth Circuit again refuses to compel arbitration. Uh, and what it concluded was, look, in this dealer agreement, the parties have delegated some but not all questions of arbitrability to the arbitrator. They carved out certain types of claims, including actions seeking injunctive relief. And this is one such action, among other things. So the Fifth Circuit concluded that the courts were entitled to determine the courts uh, were entitled to determine whether that action seeking injunctive relief was something that needed to be sent to an arbitrator. So basically, because the agreement exempted certain claims, the court continued to retain that authority to decide arbitrability, even with that clear and unmistakable delegation. Uh, perhaps not surprisingly, another cert petition was filed. Perhaps not surprisingly, it was granted. And now the question is, does an arbitration agreement that carves out or exempts certain claims from arbitration negate what would otherwise be a clear and unmistakable delegation of arbitrability to the arbitrator? And if you think about it from a kind of a process perspective, I think it comes down to two competing views. What the uh, party favoring arbitration would say is this is a question about who decides arbitrability, not what is arbitrable. And before you get to the question of what is arbitrable, you have to answer the who decides question. The Fifth Circuit essentially flipped that analysis. Um, but what the pro arbitration petitioner would say is the who decides has to go first because of the strong presumption of sending this to arbitration, because of the, the nature of the decision, one follows the other. The respondent, of course, would say the opposite. The respondent would say, you know, if a claim is expressly carved out from arbitration, there's no role for the arbitrator to play, and the who decides issue is really irrelevant. Uh, so it really is, in, in many senses, a, a framing question. 
the implications for this for companies uh, are apparent and they're pretty significant. You know, the difference between arbitrating a case and litigating a case includes issues involving the impact of the rule of law, stare decisis, uh, the nature of or availability of review for these decisions, um, and the nature of how you contract to arbitrate a case. If you have to essentially uh, batten down every hatch before you are assured of arbitrating something that you thought was clearly and unmistakably arbitrable, uh, that is going to result, I think, in a lot of revisions of contracts of uh, parties that thought that their arbitrations would proceed without further interference by a court. Um, so those are the those are the three kind of corporate focused cases uh, that I wanted to discuss. Uh, Glenn, I'm happy to uh, answer questions or whatever you would like. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I do have some questions for the audience, but I do want to ask first uh, if there are any uh, pending cert petitions that either your firm has worked on or well, ones that you've been been paying attention to that you think are are important for people to watch for, especially the, the ones that are coming up in the, the so-called long conference at the end of this month. Yeah, I mean, I, I've got one that's a personal favorite just because I'm a, I'm a bit of a pipeline nerd. Um, and that's the one um, that I think Adam mentioned in one of his slides, the 10 East case. Um, when, a, when a pipeline gets permission from FERC to build an interstate pipeline, it comes with a condemnation authority. And the question in 10 East is, can that pipeline uh, exercise that condemnation authority when it comes to a small sliver of land owned by the state? Or is the state immune from that condemnation authority? So that obviously has huge implications uh, for the pipeline industry and for interstate pipelines generally. So that's, that's the one that I'm watching most closely. Sean, any thoughts? Look, I, I think that uh, Dr. Feldman put together a very fantastic and revealing slide. I think it was slide 10, where he was showing the petitions that have the most amicus support. There's a chicken egg issue. I don't know if it's if there's amicus support because the cases are hot button or they become hot button because of the amicus. But um, you know, we all know that if there are multiple amicus briefs, the court is most likely, or more likely, I should say, uh, more likely to be granting cert. So I think I'd start with that list. Um, I don't have a personal favorite. Um, Generally speaking, I think especially with the potential change in the personnel in the court, I think there might be a heightened interest in cases that do have effects on businesses, including personal jurisdiction. I think Daubert and the class action standards also could be getting another review. My personal favorite is one that I just saw today that involves Jack Daniels suing a toy company for trademark infringement. Uh, it was a decision, I think, from the Fifth Circuit that involved uh, the First Amendment aspects of it. The, the toy was a Jack Daniels looking type bottle. And uh, we actually have a blog post on that one up on our blog. So it's definitely one that is just filed. So it's not going to be heard anytime soon. Um, the other question that I have with regards to amicus briefs is in a case like Google versus Oracle, with so many briefs, does it just become background noise for the clerks and the justices at some point, or, or do you think that they, that one of those briefs has a good chance of, of helping to sort of frame things differently or, or, or more sharply for the justices? Um, well, I, I have some thoughts on that one. Take a crack at that if you want to Appreciate it. Um, well, first of all, there, there, there are repeat players before the court that I think have a uh, significant handle on specific justices. So, you know, justices have rapport. It might be a former clerk of theirs that works for a group that now is, you know, on an amicus brief. Um, and so I, I think they're, they're looking for, for cues, just like they're looking for cues on, on cert, uh, that it's from a group they respect, it's from an attorney they respect, or maybe, you know, now, now we're seeing more frequently multiple brief, groups on the same brief. So when you have, you know, cross-cutting briefs, uh, cross-cutting groups on the same brief that, will especially like uh, be able to convey multiple ideas at once. You know, it's, it's how can the justices digest that information efficiently? So if you know, you have some serial filers that, that I'm sure never get read because they just file in, in, in multiple cases without having a, a specific connection to the court or to the justices. But I, I think they're, they're looking at, they, they, they probably weight the pile and create some kind of hierarchy 
depending on the factors that they're looking for and that they want to pull. And oftentimes it's these signals that come from the authors that come from the groups that are part of the dynamic. Look, my own personal view is that at the search stage, amicus briefs help you know, for the reason we talked about, putting aside the chicken egg thing, I think amicus briefs help there. I think they matter less once the case gets granted. And I think the caption matters a lot more than what's inside the brief. That said, sometimes, and not to just give you double props on the same brief, but for instance, the brief that you filed in the Facebook case, which identifies an issue which is not really present in this case, which will not be resolved in this case, but could alert the justice to something that should be addressed in the future, I think that has value. Are there any cases that, that to you sort of look like obvious or, or clear examples of what might be an evenly divided court uh, now that, that, that the court has eight members um, and what would happen in those kinds of situations usually? I, I can jump in unless Adam or Kate. Um, look, I mean, look, Oracle case, I don't know how to count noses in that one. That's, that's very difficult. I think that is a case which might end up 4-4, but again, I was when I was clerking, I always guessed wrong as to what was going to happen. I had inside information, so don't take any of my prognosis as being remotely accurate, but that could end up being 4-4, um, which would be good for the respondent, Oracle in this case, because they won below. Um, as for what might happen, um, if there's a confirmation of the ninth justice, they could have rehearing and then you'd have nine votes. But um, I, 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 again, not gonna make a prediction. I, uh, I, I think that the likelihood of getting an evenly divided court right now is much less than it was uh, during the vacancy after Scalia. I think that the, that the court and especially Chief Justice Roberts is good at learning lessons. And we saw three evenly divided uh, decisions like um, United States versus Texas was one of them um, in uh, in the term uh, right after Scalia passed and uh, and then the next term there weren't any evenly divided decisions even though Gorsuch wasn't confirmed until the end of the term I think the court learns with lessons it doesn't want to have that and because of that I, I think we see uh, the Chief Justice pushing the associate justices to sometimes moderate their positions a little bit to find some grounds for consensus. Kate, any thoughts on four to four splits? Well, I, just picking up on where Adam left off, I, I, I absolutely agree that you know, the, the chief, uh, but both by nature and by experience, is going to be looking for opportunities to avoid those at nearly all costs. Uh, and what that necessarily means, and this happens not just in four four splits, but to try to secure a strong opinion, a six three or a seven two rather than a five four, is that the the chief will be looking for those opportunities to write uh, a narrow opinion that will gather as many people to it as as he can uh, or as the author can. So I I think there there should be few, there will be some, uh, but hopefully not in the cases that really matter. Those cases, I assume, could be also re-argued, as has happened in the past. So we have a question that kind of harkens back to, to something I mentioned at the beginning uh, about the IQVIA case, which involves federal court's personal jurisdiction over absent class members in class action cases. There's going to be a cert petition filed in that. There's no circuit split there right now. What Do you think that, that makes it extremely unlikely that the, the, the Supreme Court is going to take up that case? Uh, or they can, do you think they'll wait for a further split? You know, I, I think if it were anything other than a personal jurisdiction case, I would say it's extremely unlikely uh, just because the court has, has such an inc inclination to wait until not just the split, but even a deep split. You know, there might be some gravitational pull towards taking the personal jurisdiction case just to try to clean up some issues uh, all at once. But I, if I were a betting person, I would bet against uh, that particular cert petition being taken up at this time. Well, the odds are, being a betting person, you should always bet against any cert petition. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what we all know is. <laughs> you should, but I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about a pretty significant shift uh, from having a cert, uh, circuit split to not, where there aren't really any other factors that make up that kind of margin. So, um, you know, that, that is, you know, fairly definitive in most instances. 
Uh, sort of along the same lines in terms of the issues. Where are where other than product liability are there heightened concerns of litigation tourism that that might arise uh, in this term? Not necessarily now, but but down down the pike as the court term goes on. Class action cases, consumer class actions. I mean, a lot of them are filed in California, which has some crazy statutes, ridiculous presumptions, and judges who don't follow the law and want to play chicken on settlement. I mean, there's a case that we had for Bayer in which the plaintiffs were saying that multivitamins are categorically worthless. And the expert in his deposition admitted they're not worthless, that he himself takes multivitamins. His wife takes multivitamins. And for decades, he's been writing about the value of multivitamins. And nonetheless, the judge out there, Judge Boric, decided this case to go to a jury. Um, with the help of our friends at Wilkinson Walsh, the jury lasted, the trial lasted about, about two days. Um, they didn't have to put on a defense because of course multivitamins are not worthless. But there's a reason why a lot of these cases are filed in California for those reasons. And judges want to have hydraulic pressure to settle. And sometimes they play chicken. And as a result of that chicken, sometimes you just have crazy cases that waste the time of innocent citizens who then have to serve on a jury. Another question, uh, are most cases that the Supreme Court grants cert in more likely to be, be closely decided cases or, or are there situations where you think it's pretty clear that, that there's going to be a decision one way or the other, nine, nothing, eight, one? Um, I think it's two cents on that. Uh, first of all, they're, they're not. Um, you, know, you have more unanimous decisions each term than you have closely decided decisions. So just a, a, in you know, a matter of numbers, that's, that's not the case. Um, although there is some fluctuation, there, 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 you know, I, I can't recall a term when there's been uh, as many 5-4 decisions as every other type of uh, a breakdown. Um, and and you know, we're, we're seeing less of that. I mean, we're, it, it, it shifts. But in you know, this past term, there were several decisions which easily could have come down as five fours. Um, you know, the, the Trump tax return decisions, uh, two, two instances. I believe there were two decisions the day before. There were seven two, where uh, where uh, Kagan and Breyer came into the majority, and Ginsburg and Sotomayor were on the edge on the dissent. Um, yeah, you 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 can predict the cases. I think with you know some accuracy that are going to come down to closely close divisions of the justices uh, just based on on past cases uh, you have an abortion case before the justices it's more likely than not going to come down to five four these are also ones that have strong ideological you know polls at them just like the slide that i showed with the five fours where most of the decisions are either conservative or liberal but not many mixed justices from both sides so it's these ones with strong ideological you know pull to them that are often, you know, somewhat predictable in, in advance because of past cases and past decisions that are the ones most likely to come down by four again. John, Kate, any thoughts on that? I think Adam summed it up pretty well from my perspective. One more question from an online viewer, uh, near and dear to our heart, the commercial speech doctrine, uh, which is still very much a mess right now in the lower courts. Uh, are there any petitions that you're aware of that are that are out there on that issue? And, and do you think they're gonna take that up again anytime soon, either compelled speech or, or limitations on speech? Not, not that I'm aware of, Glenn. Uh, this is another pet issue of mine, as you might remember. So uh, I'd, I'd be very eager to get another compelled speech, particularly a compelled commercial speech issue up to the Supreme Court. Um, but I don't know of anything in the pipeline right now. Yeah, there's one case that's going up to the Ninth Circuit now involving uh, Prop 65 and, and uh, the Roundup uh, warning. So that's that's one that might eventually uh, get to the court. The lower court judge made uh, some references about what a mess the compelled speech doctrine is and, and uh, made the right decision from our perspective. So the, the state is the one who's uh, appealing that, but that's that's probably another year away or so. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and for uh, the speakers as well for, for joining us. I definitely appreciate that. 
Uh, one uh, housekeeping note, we're going to be doing a program on the Oracle versus Google case on the first Monday, October 5th at one o'clock to uh, discuss what to look forward to in the oral arguments. We'll have uh, James Daly, who is uh, was on the brief with uh, Adam Feldman uh, in that case as well, and Adam Mossoff, who's a law professor at George Mason Scalia School of Law, uh, bringing different perspectives to it. Once again, thanks very much, and everybody enjoy the term.